Ireland and some of the Arctic regions. Some of those groups have done a huge amount of work, and I want to acknowledge that before we get underway with tonight's discussion. Further public debate and discussion about the future of this area will help us to stimulate new ideas that may not have been thought of yet and we hope will also help to refine some of the existing ideas. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and we hope that everyone will get involved. So I wanna thank you again for being here tonight. We want to ensure that all potential uses are considered to achieve the best possible outcome for the people of Christchurch and also for New Zealand. So we've asked tonight's panel, what is the greatest contribution this land could make to Christchurch and New Zealand? Tonight's event will be chaired by Jackie Bowring, Professor of Landscape, Archite sorry, Professor of Landscape Architecture at, Le at Lincoln University. I'll leave Jackie to introduce the panel, but I'd like to take this opportunity now to say thank you to the speakers and to you, the audience, for being here to spark further discussion about the opportunities for this area. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. You're welcome to take pictures during the event and upload them to social media. Uh, please just be aware of others around you if that is what you are doing, uh, as phones can be distracting for people sitting beside and behind you. So if I could ask you all to switch your phones onto silent mode or, or vibrate now. Please be aware that we do have media present uh, here at the event tonight to help us to communicate the discussion uh, and the ideas that come out. And the event is also being live streamed on Regenerate Christchurch's Facebook page. It's being videoed and it will be uploaded to the Regenerate Christchurch website in the next few days so that those who aren't able to join us tonight or aren't watching on the live stream feed can also look at the discussion and contribute their thoughts and ideas. In the event of an emergency, last little piece, uh, the gathering place for us, you'll see the exit signs uh, either side and just up to the back where the, the green men are displayed. The gathering place is in the piazza beside the piano and there will be ushers here that will help guide us out. So with no further ado, I'm going to invite the panel to come on stage uh, and I'll leave you on the hands of Jackie Bowring who will facilitate the discussion. We have four exciting panelists tonight uh, and she'll be introducing them. Thank you. Kyoto. Good evening everyone and thank you for coming along this evening. Um, as Ivan mentioned we've got a very exciting uh, group of speakers here to uh, share some ideas with you tonight, some inspiration, perhaps some provocation in terms of things that we haven't thought about yet and that's a really important part of uh, having the panellists here to bring some different points of view into thinking about what are the possibilities for this land in the red zone. And really that, that question that's at the core of the session tonight about what is the greatest contribution that the land can make to Christchurch and to New Zealand? And perhaps even beyond that, when we think about other uh, projects like this around the world that have become internationally significant. So what I'm going to do first is introduce the panellists all together and then um, we'll have them speak one after the other. And if you could save your questions until the end and then we'll have a, um, a sharing of questions at the end and encourage some uh, further conversation amongst the, the panel and with the audience as well. So the first speaker um, that we'll have this evening is Joseph Hullen. Uh, Joseph is Nga na, na Tuahuiriri in Naitahu. He's the Senior Whakapapa Registration Advisor at Tiruruunanga o Naitahu. He has a special interest in Mataranga Māori and Tikanga Māori and how this knowledge helps us better understand early land use in New Zealand and make better decisions about future land development. <clears throat> Joseph serves on a number of boards and trusts, including the Canterbury Araki Conservation Board, Te Kohaka, a Tuhai Tara Trust, which administers the Tuhai Tara Coastal Park, and Matapopri Charitable Trust, which represents the interests of Ngāi as they relate to Christchurch Central Recovery Plan. Joseph spent a lifetime gathering kai and listening to stories about his hapu. He's a hunter, gatherer, fisherman, explorer, kaitiaki, and storyteller. 
Our second speaker this evening will be Marianne van der Belt, who is an ecological economist and Assistant Vice-Chancellor of Sustainability at Victoria University, Wellington. Her interests are transdisciplinary, spanning urban, agricultural and conservation land and rivers, coastal and marine waters as they relate to human well-being. Marianne's expertise is in natural capital and ecosystem services and she has worked with iwi on social ecological entrepreneurship. She holds a PhD in marine estuarine environmental science from the University of Maryland in the United States and a Master of Business Economics from Erasmus University Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Marianne co-founded co a co-housing eco-village in the United States and was a strategy advisor to a sustainability-oriented hedge fund in the Netherlands. Our third speaker this evening will be Philippa Howden Chapman, who is a professor of public health at the University of Otago, Wellington, where she teaches uh, public policy. She's the director of Hei Kainga Oranga Housing and Health Research Program in the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities, chair of the World Health Organisation Housing and Health Guideline Development Group and the International Science Council Urban Health and Wellbeing Committee, and a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. In partnership with local communities, Philippa has conducted randomised community housing trials which have influenced housing, health and energy policies. She's strongly interested in reducing health-related inequalities and has published widely in this area. Winning awards for her work. In 2014, her research team was awarded the Prime Minister's Science Prize. She was the first woman and the first social scientist to win this prize. And our fourth speaker this evening will be Rod Oram, who has 40 years experience as an international business journalist. He's adjunct professor at the Auckland University of Technology and a frequent public speaker on business, economics, innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, Rod contributes to Nine to Noon on Radio New Zealand, newsroom.co.nz and the Larry Williams programme on Newstalk ZB. His recent publications include Reinventing Paradise in Three Cities, Seeking Hope in the Anthropocene. Rod helps fast-growing New Zealand companies through the Ice House, which is the entrepreneurship centre at AUT's business school, and was a founding trustee and second chairman of Akina Foundation, which helps social enterprises develop their business models in areas of sustainability. Rod has received a number of awards and in 2010 was columnist of the year for his editorial in Good, a consumer sustainability magazine. So I think you can tell from all of that that we have um, an incredible amount of expertise, innovation, inspiration amongst our panellists tonight. So I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph to come up and begin. Thanks, Joseph. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> Kia ora i hui hui mai nei i tēnei pō, um, koutou kua tai mai nei, e noho nei i mua mātou, kei te whakarongo i a mātou kupu me mātou whakāro. Ko wai au e tuaki nei, um, whata rama ki runga, wai maka rere te awa e rere ki te tai, um, tāne tiki te tangata, um, tua huriri te tūpuna, um, no tuahiwi aho. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you, Jackie, for the welcome. Um, my name is Joseph Hullen. I come from Tuahiwi. I was raised um, in Kaiapoi um, and I've participated in a number of discussions um, since the earthquake. Um, I'd like you to take you back and paint a picture in your mind, if you would. Um, imagine you're on a sailing ship in the 1700s and far out of the sight of land, you smell the flowers of a distant land. Flowers like hebes and tea coca, the smell from beech forest. And imagine as your boat nears um, this far off land or this distant land, that you dip your bucket over the side and raise it up and drink spring fresh water um, several miles off the coast. That was one of the features that made this country so attractive to Māori and meant, meant that we could flourish and thrive in a temperate climate. 
the attraction for my ancestors in, in Christchurch or the Otakoro. Could I get that slide up? Um, was the river and the interconnected wetlands. Habitation sites existed down in front of where the modern day sewage plant is, down on the shore at Ray, uh, Red Cliffs or Raikura as we call it, around Te Ana or Hinaraki, Moabone Point Cave. Across over here, Te Pa or Te Kararu, um, on South Brighton Spit. Over here at Ōrua Pairo, um, at about where Queen Elizabeth II Park used to stand. Over here, um, just by the Kilmore Street Fire Station, the power of Tōtahi. Um, and down on the mouth of the Opawa River, um, the power of Poho Are Are. And the location of all of those, those pa of those villages was to harvest food. The interconnected wetlands that made up the whole of the Otakaro provided tuna or eels, inaka or whitebait, pātiki or flounders, and numerous species of bird, putangitangi, paradise ducks, pāpango, or the little black scope, um, pātete, the flightless brown teal. And then there were the, the plant species that were abundant as well, harakeke, um, tea coca, kahikatea, tōtara. Within 200 years, the wetlands had all been drained and the hills and the land around it had pretty much been denuded of native vegetation. And we're faced now with an opportunity that we can actually reverse that trend of denuding the environment of its cover. We're faced with an opportunity where we can advance the case for protection and enhancement of mahinga kai values. Mahinga kai is a term that we use to talk about places where food can be generated, either naturally or by gardening or loosely interpreted as gardening or utilising of the natural resources. We're on the cusp of an era where we may well have to consider changing from our normal diet of proteins from farmed animals because of the, the effect that that's having on our land to embracing other high protein sources like insects. There's a stage in between there. There are natural species or native species that exist here that could also feed us and provide us abundant calories. The protection of these mahinga kai values in this area, I wish that we had a cute fluffy species like a kakapo that was dependent on it. Instead, we're talking about long fin tuna and short fin tuna. They're not as charismatic as a kākāpō. We're talking about shellfish like cockle and pippi and freshwater mussel. And they don't have the appeal, say, of the cheeky kia. We're talking about plant species like wee and oi oi and harakeke and tea coca. The frustration of many of our, our, our gardeners as they mow their lawns and the aprons or the leaves from the tea coca clog their lawnmower. Were they other species far more charismatic, this would be an easier argument and a much easier sell. But it is what it is, and it is what we have to live with. During some of the discussions around the residential red zone and, and earlier, um, some of the feedback were, I'd like to see a concrete edge around the estuary, because you go down to the, you go down to the shore and you get bogged in mud and then I'd be able to launch my skiff and go sailing out on the estuary and everything would be lovely. That's a nice ambition, but it's not a feasible or a reality. To create an environment like that by in installing a hard edge takes away the opportunity to pro provide habitat and sanctuary and refuge for all of those species that I've, I've, I've mentioned previously. Often on a Saturday, my partner and I will head into town and one of the most enjoyable parts of the day is to check out how the tuna are doing down at the Antigua Street boat sheds and down at the terraces. Get right down to the water's edge and to be able to hand feed them with little balls of mints that we brought along with us 
and to see the delight on children's faces, they recognise that these fish that actually look quite intimidating are also very gentle in the way they remove food from our fingers and then allow us to stroke them gently. And to add added variety, there are trout, the size of which you would, you would scarcely believe, that flip in and out, um, picking up the debris of what the eels have left behind. And it's that interaction that distracts the children and the generation of today away from their iPhone and Facebook and Twitter, and actually to get them to re-engage with the environment right down at the water's edge, and to understand that there is beauty in nature right at their feet. All they have to do is open their eyes and look down. We have an opportunity to ensure that we have a corridor all the way up into the central business district, fringed with native species, particularly nectar-bearing plants. I know for a fact that somewhere over about here on the, upper, on the Banks Peninsula at a place called Hiniwai, there is a resident population of Tui. My, partner lives, my partner's father lives in Albany in Auckland, and when, the last time we visited him, we were drowned out by the sound of Tui calling to each other, whistling and popping. I walked away from that visit so jealous. I live at Kaiapoi. I know that somewhere up about here, where the Two High Tata Trust, uh, Coastal Park is, we get some of those tui and they stop over temporarily over winter before they head up to Mount Cass and the Te Moana Reserve. My ambition before I, I curl up my toes and I pass this mortal coil is by planting all of the kōwhai trees and tea coca that I have on my quarter acre section in Kaiapoi, one of those birds will wake me up one morning with its song accompanied by some bellbirds, some korimako. Mahanga a kai is about generating food, but food doesn't only feed the, spirit, feed the body, the tinana, it feeds the spirit. The sound of birdsong in the morning is something to be cherished. My father white baits regularly on the, each season on the Arawata River on the west coast, and once again, when I go to visit him, I'm, I'm jealous of the environment he spends three months in, waking up to birdsong that's deafening and more melodious than just, just the sparrows and just the starlings that I get at Kaiapoi. Imagine by planting native species all through this corridor, there are flocks of kereru, a site that hasn't been seen in Christchurch for I don't know how many years. Imagine also there's the opportunity that all of this would lead to ecotourism, an opportunity to take people for a walk up and down the river corridor and explaining to them just how different New Zealand is to any other country in the world, how our birds evolved without the threat of ground predators. Mahinga Kai is also about cultural harvest. Rest assured, I don't want to go out and gather a kākāpō today or a kereru today, but one day, if they were so abundant that I felt confident enough that somewhere in this area I could go out and set a snare in the way my ancestors went about procuring food, and the, that application was granted, and I was successful, <clears throat> I would know we've won. I would know that we've rehabilitated the land and created a fully functioning indigenous ecosystem. All of this wetland system prior to European contact depended on the freshwater flow from the Waimakariri River. If you unroll your garden hose and leave it out on your lawn and you walk to the tap and you turn it on with the, the nozzle wide open, the hose will go wherever it wants. And on every Norwest fresh system, every time it rained up in the mountains, that's exactly what the Waimakariri River did. Some days it would flow as far north as the Rakahuri or the Ashley River. Other years it would take a line of least resistance and maybe end up flowing into, Lake, uh, into Waihorta, Lake Ellesmere and meeting the Raka, Rakaia River. And some days it just flows straight through the middle of Cathedral Square and recharges the wetlands all interconnected in here. We have an opportunity with this river corridor to actually treat on site before it's discharged into the river stormwater and slow down the, the progress of water through the environment before it goes into the river. Remove contaminants and gradually release it back. And that's a natural system. 
It's a natural event. There are countries throughout the world now who are reinvesting in installing or recreating and rehabilitating wetlands to do exactly that, to slow the passage of stormwater, to minimise the flood risk to cities and urban areas, to absorb all of that sudden deluge and then gradually release it downstream and remove that, that flood risk. We are faced with this opportunity. We also have the opportunity to use this water for other facilities, flat water facilities for rowing, for recreation. I heard discussions about an international rowing facility perhaps to replace Kerr's Reach. International rowing has a swimming standard that they require for such a facility. It far exceeds the current government's <laughs> current standard for swimming. And it far exceeds the government's previous standard for swimming. It's an opportunity for our children to re-embrace getting down to the water's edge and participating in active recreation outside moving away from their iPhone, moving away from Facebook, moving away from Twitter and Snapchat, re-engaging with nature and starting to understand that everything out there is beautiful and everything out there has a place and everything out there has a purpose. As I said, I understand the species that I'm talking about don't have the charismatic appeal of a kakapo or a kia, but they're our reality. They are what we live with. They are what fits in this environment. They are what makes it special. And we are faced with an opportunity to leave a legacy to our children and our grandchildren. <clears throat> We're on the tipping point. We can take a soft solution and leave the river as it is, <clears throat> an iconic uniform width, uniform depth drain, or we have the opportunity to restore it to a fully functioning ecosystem with eels and flounders, with mullet and kahawai, with white bait, with various species of bird, um, with forests, with low-lying podocarp forests, with shrublands. And these are opportunities that come along once in a lifetime. And it's honour beholding on us not to waste a perfectly good earthquake. <laughs> As Jackie mentioned, um, I'm the current chair of Te Kohaka Tu Haitara Trust. There's also another opportunity. So recently, as part of the Waimakariri re, uh, re, residential red zone, we were gifted fee simple some land, and also some land was placed back into the trust to become another part of the coastal park, to provide a continuous connection from the Waimakariri up into the Rakahuri River, the Ashley River. The fee simple land provides the trust with the opportunity to to create some com commercial opportunity and some income to continuously provide funding for the programs that we're running. These are ideas that shouldn't be discouraged or ruled out in the red zone. For instance, Ihu Tai, in 1860, 1868, Ihu Tai was recognised, a claim was made for it in the Native Land Court. In 1887, um, the survivors of or the descendants of the 87 names of the Kaiapoi people who were listed in 1868 were gazetted as the owners of Ihu Tai. There's an opportunity for some of that land to perhaps be vested back into the Ihu Tai Trust in a co-governance arrangement similar to that of Te Kohaka Tu Haitara Trust with the Ihu, Ihu Tai Trustees of Ngai Tuahuriri Runanga and the Council. There should also be the opportunity to install commercial opportunities along that stretch of the river. There are large parcels that we can utilise. In Holland at the moment, there is a suburb, 97 floating houses built on pontoons made out of concrete and polystyrene or styrofoam, secured by posts. There's an opportunity to recreate housing in areas that have been discounted because of land remediation issues. In Japan, you have a country who lives with earthquakes more frequently than we do, and they've managed to adapt their housing style and their construction methods um, to live in that environment, and perhaps that's something we also need to do.
where the other elephant in the room is something that Donald Trump refuses to acknowledge, is climate change. And so along Anzac Drive here, there's an opportunity to realign the stock bank, perhaps parallel with the road, and then utilise all of this land in here as a natural ecosystem. So widen the river, create multiple channels, and provide further sanctuary and habitat for, for bird species, fish species, and for engagement with people um, with the environment. They are basically the opportunities that, that I see. From my perspective, it's a, it's a Ngaituahu to the Ngaituahu um, perception. Bear in mind that most Ngaituahu to the most Ngaituahu, we have shared whakapapa. We're not just one race. My father is fifth generation European. He has brothers and sisters. Those brothers and sisters have children. Their children are my first cousins. The aspirations that I have are beneficial not only to my family, but also my wider family, my whānau, my European whānau, and my Ngaitahu Ngaituahuriri whānau. And in the same way those aspirations are beneficial to them, they're also beneficial to you. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, I think that's already given everyone a lot of food for thought, pardon the pun. And um, hand over to our next speaker, who's Marianne Vanderbilt. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. First, I'd like to honour the people of the land, those who came before us, those who sure, I'm sure will come after us, and thereby bringing us to the sanctity of this moment. It's quite special to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Regenerate and Tiputahi, say that correctly, and City Council, of course. Um, I'm in, I haven't really been to Christchurch, so I'll come with a, kind of the, um, the mind of a child to this situation. Uh, but I'm really hoping that I can give you a gift uh, in the sense that um, bring you a different perspective. So I'm an ecological economist. How many people in the audience have met an ecological economist? One, two. Oh, a few, good, maybe 10. So um, an ecological economist is uh, quite different from an environmental economist. An environmental economist will take the traditional economic toolkit and apply it to environmental topics. An ecological economist will think first about the ecosystem, nature, and the carrying capacity of the society that it can carry. Then we think about fairness of distribution, and then how can we come up and design new tools that will solve the questions that we actually have. Yeah, so it's quite a design-oriented uh, approach. So when I was asked to, uh, to come and, and, and give a talk, uh, I said to uh, Jessica, so um, what does the river want to be? What does the river want to be? And she says, huh, not sure we've ever thought about that. So I want to talk a little bit about what the river wants to be. Um, there's quite a big shift happening, actually. In 1889, corporations were given legal personhood. They were, for the first time, uh, recognized as legal entities, non-human entities. And here we are. 130 years later, and we are now demanding that ecosystems, rivers, oceans, are recognized in the same way. Can you imagine how long that took us? If you can recognize a corporation as a legal entity, surely we can recognize rivers and oceans as a legal entity. 
And, oh, so, and just this year, this year, the Wanganui River in New Zealand has received, is now recognized as a legal entity. It's the first river in the world. This is exciting. New Zealand is leading this. Yes? It's not unusual that this year, at the same time, uh, Himalayan uh, glaciers were recognized. Uh, so it's taking off. The US, Hawaii has some water bodies where the same thing is happening. So what about this river? Yeah, can that be recognized as a legal entity? And in that, at that point, it would be the Kaitiaki guardians who then start to think about how people need to behave toward that river. So I think that's quite an exciting um, uh, question. So what are those, are there places where the river would want or need to go? What are the benefits for our people of working with the river and the land? And this is a little bit more, you know, uh, the economist in me that then says, well, if we get this right, what kind of savings would we actually have? And can we envision those savings and then start thinking about how we're going to use that to actually build the kind of um, communities that we really want? So I want to, want, you, want to leave you pondering those questions. Um, the rest of the story is quite a personal story, if that's okay. I'm not talking to you as an academic at all. And it's one of change. Things change quite, quite a bit. People, people don't really like change. We're social animals, but we don't really like change. Uh, but change happens. This is a house I built with my partner in Maryland, in, in, uh, in, in the US. Beautiful house. It's like a passive solar house. It's a passive solar oven. It has a lot of thermal mass in there. It, this house is about four times as big as the house I currently live in. And it took about four times less energy to heat it. It almost runs itself. It's quite fascinating. Is anybody interested how the inside looks? Yeah. Oh, great. Good. Because I think it's quite cool. This was my idea here. It is, uh, these are water columns, two feet high water columns. And again, they equalize the temperature in, the, uh, in, in a room. So there's a lot of thermal mass. Once it's warm, it takes a long time to cool it. These are really cool ways to, um, to warm and cool uh, your houses and how you think about houses. Beautiful, beautiful house. Um, one problem with it, it was built about a kilometer away from the nearest road. Uh, so I had two babies. I talked a lot to those babies. And then I talked to my bees and my horse. Yeah. And by the time I started talking to the lettuces, I knew it was time to move. <laughs> I moved to, I met my partner to, uh, to Vermont. And um, the real exciting thing about Vermont was that there was a community who wanted to build a co-housing eco-village. Uh, and so, uh, none of us were developers, but we bought a piece of land the size of 48 um, rugby fields. It was zoned to be cut up in 27 rugby fields, but instead we clustered 27 houses on the size of about three rugby fields, thereby leaving, uh, preserving a stream and a forest, um, and building the, the houses in such a way that we had all private spaces, but a lot of share spaces as well, so we could share meals and things like that. And of course, there was a, a residential farmer, and uh, the community supported this farmer uh, to have a, a, a guaranteed income so that she could produce healthy food for us. <clears throat> we had a collaborative governance system, which was called sociocracy. Um, it's you can, you can look it up, it's quite interesting. Some t Oops, gosh, come here. Sometimes people call it socio-crazy. Um, but it worked quite well. Against all odds, this six million dollar development was uh, you know, materialized. Sorry. Um, yeah, and it was quite amazing. Every time we thought we would lose the piece of land, something magical happened. Someone came in like, oh, 
oh, you're about to lose the land tomorrow to the bank. I got a million dollar in my pocket. It was amazing how it kept happening. You know, we just kept believing and we didn't know where it was going to go, but uh, it, it worked. Uh, again, just some pretty pictures because I, I don't have too much time. Um, yeah, please, the, the, the time sharing and barter. I was into beekeeping, obviously, and uh, so I would, I would trade chores, my chores away for, uh, for honey and for, uh, for goat cheese. Um, a resilient community, so we made sure that we had like a hand-cranked water pump. So if something would happen, uh, we would all have water. Uh, made sense to me. Uh, it was very multi-age. I could tell you the story around this, uh, this circle of women there, uh, or I could continue. Anybody want to hear the story? That's, yeah, yeah, it's a very good story. So what we did, we made up a <laughs> we made up a, a habit that whenever uh, a girl would turn seven, she would oh gosh, this is having a will of its own. Here, um, we would uh, um, the, the women would gather and and and, uh, and sit around a circle, and they would tell stories from the time that they were seven, and uh, and give the girl a gift. A very small, tiny little token, something like, mm, I will teach you to bake a chocolate cake, or I will take you to your first you know, opera or something. And it was quite amazing. The girl there in the pink uh, is, is my daughter, and um, she came back and she said, Mom, this was the best day of my life. And it, it was, you know, it, it we weaves that fabric for the child and it takes it from just the onus on me as the mother and it broadens the perspective. So this little girl, this morning I got texts that she's in Sicily. She's uh, on a, working on an organic farm teaching Italian children uh, English and she's quite happy. So that's my eight, now 18 year old. And I think that villages do that. It takes a village to raise a child. This is our sister project in, uh, in Burlington, so to give you a flavor, there's also urban variations of this. And then I moved to New Zealand. You can wonder why. <laughs> uh, well, I, I thought, wow, well, if we can do 27 houses, what can you do in New Zealand? <laughs> so I saw an opportunity, opportunity to apply the same ecological economic principles to the village of, uh, of New Zealand. Of course, my bees came. Now they are the urban variation. They got look a lot flasher than they did in the uh, in the other village. <coughs> Excuse me. How many people know uh, of an eco village or a co housing community? Yeah, quite a few. Oh, that's that's a bit surprising because um, it's not very well known. Did, did you know this one? There was this one in in Wanganui. Yeah. They're, it's amazing, they, they are around. And here's another one, Earth Song in West Auckland, right close to another one in Auckland that doesn't want to know that it exists. I, I think there are quite a few of them, uh, but they are not really talking a lot about it. I think eco-villages, co-housing communities have a bit of a bad reputation in New Zealand. I think it has some association with, um, with a commune. Um, and that's a pity, because it really is a nice way to live uh, for people. And it start, does start to, uh, to pick up. Here is a, a co-housing project that's going to come online in 2019. I think they're almost sold out already. And uh, in the US, they're stepping it really up. The, the, now the developers are getting involved, um, because it makes sense for people to have smaller spaces where they have a kitchen and a bedroom and all that, and then uh, shared spaces to meet nice people and to interact with people and to, you know, come up with projects and ideas and, you know, maybe start a business or something. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to, to engage with people. It's actually what we do. We are social beings. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I really wanted to put this one in. Affordable housing. We did have uh, an affordable housing scheme in our eco-village eco as well to ensure that some of those houses would actually remain uh, affordable and we would maintain a diverse uh, community. And who has heard of this, uh, this project? Alejandro Arave. Yeah, good. One, two, good. 
It's so exciting. They're thinking completely differently about housing. Yeah? So they had no space, no money. So with the very, very basics, they decided to build half a good house. Yes, to at least have people have a roof over their heads so they could start to build up a life. And once they did, then they were allowed to fill in the other half of the house. And it really engaged people. So rather than doing it for people, there's a real good uh, argument for making sure that people can have the basics and then provide enough space so they can engage themselves and, uh, and co-create uh, what people really want, because that makes, makes a good neighborhood. Ah, this is another, and who has heard of Regen? Yes, there are a few people really switched on on this. Exciting. Yeah, so this is my, uh, my home country, the Netherlands. Um, and they're, they're going to be first off uh, with a, um, uh, a community that is completely self-sufficient. So creates its own energy, its own food, um, takes care of its own waste, completely self-sufficient. I do see a lot of glass. I'm not sure how that works in earthquakes here in New Zealand. Um, but it's a really exciting idea. So, some characteristics of these co-housing eco-neighborhoods. Of course, as uh, neighbors, you, you kind of want to be part of it. If you're really a hermit, not a good idea. But at the same time, it, you don't have to engage with people all the time. I'm personally not the one who will engage all the time. Um, but there is a, a culture of sharing before you buy things. For example, we had one big mother of all lawnmower instead of 27. It makes sense. So the, the, the task is you, you mow once a year, which I would pay off with honey. But um, it, it, that's the idea. Uh, yeah. And it's designed to promote interaction. So here you often see a road on the inside and then houses on the outside. We did it exactly the other way around. We had the, the road on the outside and the houses and access to each other on the inside. We already talked about the decision-making aspect of it. And um, yeah, often there is a, uh, a drive to live easy on the land. I wanted to tell you one more little story, the living and working in a community, because it's not just about having a house and living in it. And I want to tell you about last year, I worked with an iwi, uh, Nararu, in the Wanganui Taranaki uh, area. And the stream gotten contaminated and no longer feeds people um, with watercress. And so then one of the elderly started to grow watercress at her home. And then the Iwi leaders asked the community what you could possibly make out of watercress. And of course this community came up with an abundance of ideas of what you could make out of watercress. So by the end of this year, they will launch a company. And this is very exciting, because not only does this company provide meaningful jobs for people, the beauty of this story is that they're, the intention is that they're going to uh, take part of the profits and reinvest it back into the stream that created and gave them the idea and inspired the idea in the first place. Yeah? So you get this, this reciprocity, this giving back, um, this regenerative economy. And I think that is critical in, in uh, projects like this. So when we're thinking about uh, a transition, we often think about the past, which leads to now, which leads to the future. You know what the problem with this is? You get the past put into your future. Nothing changes. So a, another way of looking at this would be to start with the future and envision that future. What is it that we really want? How would that look? And then that is the future that inspires our actions right now. Yeah. We can still learn, we have to learn from the past, but we have to co-create from a, a place of vision of what we want that future really to be. And that's why I'm really excited to be here today and, uh, and be part of this story. So, I just went with a big idea. <laughs> Not knowing at all anything, so shoot me. Um, 
What if this is an opportunity for the world's largest co-housing eco-village, along with not necessarily this land, but I'm looking at the whole area. What if you know, the river tells us what it wants to be? And then we create these new uh, neighborhoods in the right places because we kind of know where climate change is going to cause sea level rise and other problems. And so this is part of that process, in my view, uh, of thinking about thinking differently around the entire area. So what does it look like if, if we're part of nature rather than masters of nature? What would a, social, a more fair social contract look like? And then it's about place making, housing, working, governing. You see there's ing on all the ends? It's an activity, it's an ongoing process. It doesn't really stop. It's a constant co-creation. And I want to end with um, the wisdom of the, an important American philosopher and baseball coach, uh, Yogi Berra. If you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. So I wish you all the best with this amazing conversation that you're having. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Marianne. A lot more um, provoking ideas there in terms of uh, possibilities that we can come back to at the end. And now I'd like to introduce Philippa Howden Chapman. Oh, you need to click first. Tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi o hinki nā tahu, nā mihi ki te kōpapa o tēnā pō. Well, I'm very honoured to be here. I've had the pleasure and of coming down a number of times since the earthquakes. I have the colleagues in the university here, and I've attempted to build houses here with Housing New Zealand and I've been contributed to the Free Range Press, that wonderful thing that your local publishers did. So, my ideas, I come from a public health background, but I also, I used to be a family therapist, so I'm very interested in the idea of thinking about systems and how one thing affects another. So um, I should thank also Regenerate Christchurch, Tukotahi, and, and the City Council, who I and I admire you all for the challenges and the way you're grappling with it. So I walk to work every day um, past social housing in, in Wellington, and uh, I, this um, the fare and the warrior always reminds me that things that we do, we must think about the treaty and the partnership between us. Um, I'm a collector of uh, graffiti, and this I thought this is, this is the kind of thing that we think after earthquakes, what, where to and what to do. Now, we gathered together, I'm director of um, New Zealand Centre of Sustainable Cities, and after the earthquake, and um, we gathered together town planners and engineers and policy makers and anybody who had a real interest in what to do about planning in Christchurch. And we came up with, we um, um, put together, we spent a day working together, and then we wrote up this book. And I thought I'd revisit it, I visited it um, as a basis of this. And you'll see that we thought that the vision was most important, so that's similar to what Marianne was talking about. And that we needed an alliance of researchers, policy, iwi, um, that was separate from CERA. We were concerned about the... Um, needing some independence um, here. And the main thing we were interested in doing is thinking about the city as a system. And today I'm going to um, thank a bit about community formation, but most particularly about um, um, thinking about how housing and transport can work together as an example of a system. Because after all, if your house is way on the wop wops and you've got to pay to come in um, with petrol in your car, that's going to be much less sustainable than if we can um, recreate the city, the centre of the city. So we are very um, interested in working with the Māori colleagues, and we published this book on Tāne Tupu Ora, and um, we've already had a wonderful exposition about thinking about the city and the land and the people um, in the way that 
uh, Māori um, tribes had, particularly in the pa, the place that you retreat to, or kaianga, where the village was, and then the place where you gather food. And uh, many of you will have seen had we actually um, re been respectful of the knowledge that um, Māori had traditionally about where the historical streams were and so forth, um, the city might have looked rather different. Now, I've had the pleasure of... Um, we got a large grant from Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. And one of the things we did is went and looked at the way other cities had refashioned themselves. And this is Harmerby in Stockholm. It was actually in an area that was a very contaminated waste site, an old industrial area, and they had to remove lots of soil. But you'll see here that they, um, they do a very beautiful way of having apartment buildings crossing over the water and lakes, um, it was planned with different developers doing different segments of it, but it was planning recre housing, recreation, and also transport. And that's absolutely critical if one's thinking in a systems way. Um, we took delight in looking in the unexpected green in Paris. You can see here, actually, what's the, is that the, which is the um, light here? Which is the one that just the light? Oh, okay course. <laughs> you can see here the uh, window here. This is actually an apartment building. And people take such pleasure in this that they're always sitting down below it. And this is an old um, abbey in, in London. That idea that you don't need huge big parks, but it's very nice to come around a corner and see greenery. And we looked at examples of a track compact of urban development. This is transit-oriented development in Strasbourg in France. Uh, one in Bern, refitted into a city that's a UNESCO um, city. And London, um, where you see that there's this mixture of coming out at, I think this is Tottenham Court Road, and then coming out in the shared bikes here. Uh, and particularly, I have a daughter as an artist, Amy Harden Chapman, and she, I, I've always been very interested in art, and I think the culturally rich urban space is actually really, really important. The public realm defines the city, I think, and I think there's been great things done, starting to be done along the Avon. And people slow down to enjoy amenities and art. Um, I, don't, I think the roads are the least important part of a city. You don't want people going through a fast in a city. It's a place to get together and enjoy each other. And this is an example from Whanganui, coming from internationally, now locally. Um, Whanganui, as you know, the river has floods in the same way as the Avon does now. So they've used it as a walkway, and all along the way you see these um, lovely sculptures, um, which I think is, captures rather lovely the winding of the river going down to the sea. Um, I'm a, I think some of the art that you've got in public buildings is absolutely amazing. Um, I, I'd love to know who did this, if anyone can tell me afterwards. Is someone not someone in the audience? I think this is a really, this rising tide, and oh, my little darling, the mother anxious, you know, the rising tide supposedly raises all boats. Uh, but it also reminded me of James Dan, the parking nightmare. What happens if we rebuild the city and we build it round the car? This is a real lost opportunity. Uh, as he puts it, parking nightmare, how the car lobby is hijacking the Christchurch CBD. The, the cars are um, technology of, of, of the past, and I think um, to fashion the city around cars is a big mistake. Um, I, I had to give a plug here for the physics room, which I think is an amazing cultural hu uh, hub in Christchurch. And my um, daughter Amy did this brick four glass wall at the physics room um, last year. And she did that because she'd been living in Los Angeles and she was absolutely staggered by the fact that the Marin County Los Angeles glass walls were all being re reproduced um, around... Um, uh, Christchurch, and what we know that's a crucially important for act, is active edges, where you can look in a shop, you can go into a coffee bar, you can see people. So we don't want to be building all these buildings that you can't actually see into, or where they're not. Uh, there's nothing to do at the bottom level, and there are rather a lot of them. And I don't think having um, this is the provocative part. I don't think having precincts where you know that's just justice or just this. It's not the way organically things grow, I don't think. Now, <laughs> sorry, that's the provocative. <laughs>
Okay, now I am obsessed with housing. In fact, people say, when are you going to retire? And I say, not till I've got housing better. So a city for well-being, you need a mix of housing, rental and owner-occupied. And urban planning, residential zoning, transport system, all affect standards of health. And of course, in the 19th century, when there were lead works or abattoirs or mortuaries, you don't want those in the middle of the city and people so went, went out to the garden suburbs to get... Um, to be healthy, but now I think the separation of work and residential areas increases suburbanization, and I've made that point. I think we have to be zero carbon by 2050. We're not going to be that if most of us live in suburbs. And I understand why people needed houses and went out, but personally, I would say that I think it's really important that the city governments, as they're trying to do now, and central governments actually has a role in building affordable housing because it's quite understandable that um, developers um, have a different model of what's required to keep their business going than working at the, at the low end of the market. And um, I found this in Auckland. Even if you don't believe in climate change, there's money to be made doing something about it. There's money in being green. So there's, there's motivation in here for, for everyone. Um, I've collected in my visits up and down to Christchurch quite a lot of graffiti, and I think, you know, out of the, on the, on the side of fences, there's a lot of truth. There is a housing crisis, um, and I was, took up the offer of Jessica and um, Emma and people to um, do a study of just looking at who lost their houses in Christchurch. And, of course, we know that... Um, the red zone is the area that we were kindly taken up today. You know, 16, almost 70,000 empty buildings in Greater um, Christchurch. This is now written a couple of years ago. Rent's still going up then. And most particularly, if I come to the bottom part here, um, little provision of permanent, affordable housing for displaced people or disabled people, who of course were in large part in the, in the red zone. Any rebuild, it has to have that, to Pumanawa Hora, it has to have that beating heart of people in the center. <sighs> This distresses me. I've come down maybe three times in the last six months. I've never seen so many homeless people in Christchurch before. And it gets damn cold down here. So I would hate to be in a tent or um, the physics room, of course, is just round the corner from here. And I watched people going in and out of this building. I saw a hand just lock, locking, um, locking that door there um, and with people inside. That, to me, is... Well, it looks like Grenville Towers or somewhere. It looks incredibly dangerous for people to be living in there. And then I saw, so I do think it's, I love this graffiti, it's environmental to um, have people living in, in, in those kind of places. Um, I wrote a book about it. I had that no word that we're not supposed to say with crisis in it. I wrote this in 2015 um, to be to a prompt of what I think we could do about it. Um, but also I like to think that what pleasure it would come if we did get our housing correct. This is an Adam Waghorn painting. Um, indeed, we could see rainbows and sunshine again, and um, we could still be lying in the grass down here, um, having a tryst in the grass, or maybe dancing. <laughs> so I think the OECD and its environment performance review um, reminds us that actually we, the, the, what New Zealand is doing, um, the roading public transport split is 90 to 10. So only 10% of our money is spent on uh, cycleways and walkways. That is completely crazy because we know the, that New Zealanders are cycling and walking less and less and that puts, makes us put on more and more weight. Um, There's an example from Wellington where the, we were lucky enough to um, keep our, our, um, our modernist flats which were done up with a combination of central government and local government which is obviously the way to go. I mean the, 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 the local government can't bear all the costs of doing this. And then um, with trams um, here and then people can walk backwards and forwards. 
Um, so I think that kind of integration is what I'm talking about. And, and somebody from my group recently did this. This is uh, Marie uh, Russell and Caroline Shaw. And this shows, this is only one graph I'm showing you. <laughs> but here, along here, this is walking and cycling. This is the percentage of trips that are taken in what we call active journeys. In other words, you don't get in your car and turn on the key, you walk or cycle. And this is Hamilton, Torrum, Auckland, and here we are in Christchurch. So you have um, actually not a very high level of walking and cycling, about average. Um, and then um, same with, sorry, this is the amount of walking and cycling, sorry. The red line is the walking and cycling, trips taken by walking and cycling. And this, the little diamonds, the blue diamonds, is the percentage of um, diabetes in the area. Now this is what um, public health people called, uh, it's an ecological one, it's an association. But nevertheless, um, you can see here um, that Christchurch, if it um, was, it was able, was, um, has a reasonably, um, it's got lower diabetes rate than Auckland and uh, lower than Hamilton, um, but higher than Wellington. Uh, so that, that we were building in the health, our health, when we build a city. And uh, a study that somebody did in our group called Kate Whitwell, she looked at when the government, I think very sensibly, decided to move the government buildings into the centre of the city. She looked at where the people lived and how far they'd had to travel and how they came to work. And, uh, and she was looking to see if you can move the from suburban offices to central offices, what happens. And her thesis, she's just about to hand in, so I can't tell you the answer, but it is very positive. So I think when we make strategic decisions about where big infrastructure is, where people work can make a big difference. And here's a happy punter. Bus is a must, ditching the car pays off. I'm someone who is one of these people who lived in the outer area and now lives in the city. So finally, um, I mentioned that I was on a committee, the International Council of Science, and the, the inter best international practice now is thinking not just about transport, not just about roads, or not just about housing, or not just about green fields, not about air quality, but thinking about what the effect one of one is on the other. And you can see here, this is the diagram that um, they um, used to show how we're all linked into the world. It, and uh, 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 this has just come out, and I've done the chapter on health and cities and well-being, and there's such fantastic opportunities in the way that things could possibly to be done in Christchurch that I realise it's a huge, huge and challenging job. So in conclusion, um, I think... Uh, that, I always think of that rather like a mushroom, one of those amazing mushrooms that you see that are in ball shapes, where the, the structure of um, is, is really strong because there's linkages from all sorts of ways. So integrating urban planning, and we were lucky to be taken around by an urban planner and an engineer today, housing, land use mix, the real importance of active transport and public... How many people will actually... Oh, it's night. I was going to ask how many walked or cycled here tonight or public transport. Maybe I will. Who walked or cycled or public transport? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Very good. Critical for health and well-being. You're probably... If we compared your weight compared to those who came by cars, you'd be lighter. <laughs> Housing should be the first priority in any rebuild. As significant, as culturally significant as the anchor projects are, housing has to be first. It's, it is extraordinary, you know, and you know, six years after the earthquake, there are still people living in shattered old commercial buildings or on the streets. And uh, while it is, I, I, I think urban intensification, though difficult now with that donut shop, has huge advantages for the sociability, for the, the, for the pleasure of unexpectedly bumping into people, uh, and for carbon mitigation. Um, a compact city uses much less carbon or emits much less carbon than very dispersed suburbs. It creates wealth because people have ideas when they're talking over coffee and so forth, and social inclusion. We saw those rather sad um, houses where people are left in the red zone today, and I thought that's such an example of social exclusion and 
and I know that Christchurch, there are wonderful, wonderful parts about Christchurch, and I wish you all the best. Great. Thank you very much, Philippa. <laughs> and on to our final speaker for this evening, Rod Oram. Welcome, Rod. Um, kia ora tato, good evening, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Um, I only have a chance to get down uh, to Christchurch from time to time um, to keep track as best I can as to how you are uh, recreating the city, um, and um, I'm always very grateful for opportunities to um, come and learn some more and um, um, uh, in try to integrate a lot of what I've been learning. As it happens, and, and this is not, I don't think it's quite by design, um, um, in terms of co um, an integration of um, how each of us have addressed this, uh, we're all, I think, offering very important parts as to um, how the residential red zone can have um, an extraordinary impact. Um, in terms of its regeneration, um, not just on the city of Christchurch, but the country. And I'll also make the case to you um, that you will help point the way um, to how we solve some uh, truly enormous issues which are very global in their scope. Um, so I'm gonna make the case to you that this is about the um, transformational power of the residential red zone. Um, it's essentially how the ecosystem of the red zone can heal many things, uh, many of the ills of this city uh, and many of the ills of um, um, urban life um, more widely. Um, so in that small attempt, we are trying to reinvent paradise. Um, let me start at this point. Um, Geologists are trying to work out whether we really have started the Anthropocene. And this is the geological epoch in which human activity is the greatest driver of planetary change. Um, they started that work at their Congress last year, and it'll, they'll be done in a year or two. Uh, I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes, um, <laughs> um, because this is what's going on. So about 75% of the Earth's surface is act that is land that doesn't have snow or ice permanently on it, uh, is actively managed um, by humans, and uh, by and large, uh, very badly. Um, cities have a really big role in this. Um, the illustrations I'm about to show are from a terrific exhibition in London at the Modern Tate Gallery in 2007, which was the year the United Nations deemed that for the first time in human history, 50% uh, of human population now lived in cities. Now, we're actually heading at least to about 85% of people living in towns and cities. The reason for that is multiple um, around uh, social interaction, um, so a vast proportion of uh, culture and science and art and industry all happen in cities um, because of the way people interact. Um, but of course, um, Cities are prodigious um, producers, for example, of um, carbon dioxide um, and therefore have a big impact on climate change. But they also have a very big impact on our lack of sustainability in other ways, um, such as the way cities are very dependent on intensive industrial agriculture and farming for food um, outside the cities. Um, the... Um, exhibition at the Tate um, posed some really important questions. Uh, can cities be improved by design? Um, can cities promote social justice and greater equality? Now, those were pretty um, extreme examples of cities gone really wrong. Uh, but I would argue that um, our cities are, are almost as broken um, in New Zealand, um, not as uh, spectacularly because they are very uh, uh, lot less dense. They are um, much newer cities in, in world terms. Um, but um, the challenges that we face around these issues um, are exactly the ones that much larger cities uh, are, um, are dealing with. Um, that previous poster is this place in Sao Paulo where you can see um, the favela on the um, left-hand side and the very rich living um, in extraordinary luxury with each apartment having its own Babylonian hanging garden. Um, and that's obviously 
quite not the urban design we're after. Um, I think one of the key concepts that come through, though, is that um, our urban areas will have to fundamentally change. Um, by bringing nature back into the cities, and not just in, for, in terms of you know, nice trees or parks um, to uh, give a bit of rest for our eyes, um, but about making um, cities largely self-sufficient for food and hopefully fairly naturally grown food, um, and um, self-sufficient for energy and other resources, and also be very, very delightful and enlivening um, places um, to live and work. Because at the heart of that, it's actually about restoring our relationship with the ecosystem. So um, it's relatively easy to try to do that out in a fairly wild or rural place. It's an awful lot harder to do it in the city. But we've actually got to do it in cities um, because that's where the vast majority of us are going to live. One of the challenges for us as New Zealanders, though, we are already about 85% urbanized. In fact, as a population in New Zealand, we're more urbanized than the population of, say, France or Germany. But the problem for us as New Zealanders is we define ourselves by our rural and wild parts, and indeed, to a large extent, by the economies of those parts, whether it be tourism or agriculture, um, um, rather than defining ourselves um, as urban people, which we are. So the great journey we would be on would be to make um, our towns and cities in New Zealand, and particularly the residential red zone, um, the absolute exemplar um, of um, bringing, uh, restoring the ri our right relationship with the ecosystem. And these are issues that have already been touched on in terms of um, the marvelous first presentation we had about the deep ecological history um, of this place, and particularly around the river um, and um, what is now the residential red zone. Um, or Marianne's um, view of um, how social housing and new social constructs, new ways of working together, um, achieve um, a, a deeper integration. Uh, and, and then um, also with Philippa's view uh, of uh, her work around these issues. Let me offer you this thought, um, which is from one of my um, favorite writers um, on the nature of um, people in cities. And um, this is from Lewis Mumford, the American sociologist and historian back in 1938. The city is a fact of nature, like a cave, a run of mackerel, or an ant heap, but also a, a conscious work of art which within it holds its communal framework many smaller and more personal forms of art. Mind takes form in the city and in turn urban form conditions mind. I would happily be very rude about what Auckland's like at the moment, um, although th there's a glimmer of hope. Um, but to be totally blunt, uh, what's been going on in Christchurch post-earthquakes post has been to create a reasonably... Look, I feel sorry, to, I, I apologize for saying this, but for um, so far what's been achieved is to uh, produce a, a reasonably nice um, newly built um, evocation of an early or a late 20th century city. Um, Um, Christchurch today and what's planned so far is not, is absolutely not a 21st century city. Um, and um, the best hope for you by far is the residential red zone um, to be able to be real pioneers in the sort of um, uh, concepts and great um, inspiration you've heard from um, previous speakers, and again I would add that overlay of our relationship with the ecosystem, um, to um, steer the further development of Christchurch um, in a very different direction, um, and write a new chapter, if you like, um, in the city in history. There are great programs around, so, such as the United Nations uh, Global Compact and its cities program, and um, there are very um, small cities large towns in this program. Um, and it's a terrific framework for um, thinking um, in that deeply, deeply integrated way uh, about our relationship between um, uh, 
us as humans and, um, and our environment in an urban sense. The Stockholm Resilience Center, which um, has given us such terrific insight around, for example, the planetary boundaries, showing that where we are seriously breaching those physical chemical boundaries. Um, um, in another part of its very great work um, is to keep track of um, uh, cities um, and towns around the world which are starting to re respond to a dealing with those breaches and those planetary boundaries. And this is a part of their websites, it's called the Seeds of Good Anthropocenes. Um, and um, this is an extraordinarily exciting view of what the absolute leading edge of this is. And I have absolutely no doubt um, that Christchurch can be there too. Um, but it'll be because of the residential red zone, uh, not, for example, rebuilding the cathedral um, in its 19th century glory. Um, um, I say that as a very, as a lifelong Anglican <laughs> um, who longs for a 21st century uh, expression of Anglicanism. Um, anyway, um, the, uh, there are some very challenging disciplines around. So one of them is the living building challenge, which originated in Seattle, in which buildings are entirely self-sufficient for power and water. And uh, the first building to, be, um, to win that accolade was the Bullet Center um, in Seattle, um, which looks, of course, very much like um, an American building. The first building um, in New Zealand to um, win the living um, building um, standard um, was this glorious building of Tuhois in the Uruera. And this, of course, is absolutely right, because whatever we do has to be a complete expression of ourselves. Um, and therefore, what you do in Christchurch would be quite different from what we have to do, say, in Auckland. Um, and um, so the ability, I hearken back to Mumford there, about our urban form conditioning our mind, but our mind also um, creating that urban form, uh, that we need to dr draw, draw very deeply um, on our um, history and culture um, for all of the um, people, the, the first people in this land, um, Maori, and then uh, those of us who have come later, um, to um, give um, a unique expression of this. So that now gets me on to this. And um, to the particular matter at heart. And as I was looking at this map, and um, I'm glad we're using the same map um, on this. Yours was much higher definition. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Mine's slightly fuzzy. Um, I thought of this, the first thought that sprung to mind was that somehow um, the river um, was an umbilical cord, if you like, um, reconnecting people in the ecosystem but also connecting um, the city with the sea. So if I would have one plea for planners, is that um, the residential red zone didn't stop arbitrarily where um, some insurance loss adjusters decided that liquefaction uh, was no longer an issue, um, that it at least should be an ecosystem view um, that extends all the way to the, at least to the estuary, um, if not to the sea itself. Um, so there could be a truly deep integration across that. Um, but the idea across this remarkable landscape, one that is immensely threatened um, by sea level rise um, and immensely threatened by urban blight, um, is, um, is a very, very, very fragile thing. We don't restore that. The ecosystem restores itself. It has absolutely the power to restore itself. That's one of its great glories. Um, but we have to give it the chance to do so. Um, so as you go about um, your imagining and your planning and your work on this, um, it's about, to borrow Marianne's phrase, it's about letting the river go where it may or let the ecosystem uh, restore as it will. I think one of the things that has to be confronted is that the way that um, we people have used this land since the Second World War um, has had some disastrous outcomes for people. Uh, I don't know quite what it was about whether it was just cheap land which allowed cheap houses to be built, which allowed people on poor incomes um, to live there. 
Um, but the social and um, cultural and health and all the other impacts of that um, are truly huge. That, that huge. That is a... God, I sound like Donald Trump there for a moment. Um, <laughs> it's truly huge. Um, and and um, there is a real justice issue there. Um, so if I may suggest that it's a bit cheeky of me to do so, um, to think of the healing of the ecosystem as, of, along the river as part of that healing of those injustices um, would be, I mean, that's some of the healing that can happen that I alluded to earlier. Um, and um, there's no end of data a around those sorts of impacts um, as this was. Um, I was very interested in this um, deep survey work that Nielsen did for Regenerate Christchurch, and it's a very clear expression of all that's important to people who are interviewed. I had a particular problem with their selection of people, though. The youngest person they interviewed was 15, um, which I think is not nearly young enough, um, because a lot of this won't happen until people far younger are actually are adults. Um, and yet, younger people um, can have a more, uh, often have extraordinary insight, um, uncluttered by prejudice and history um, that they acquire later, um, and, um, and have a, a great truth in their simplicity. And, and so I, I know talking to um, uh, a little bit earlier today about the work that Regenerate Christchurch is doing, I know that it's going into schools and talking to um, children about that, and I think that's absolutely dead right. But here's the, the thing that I found that I, I was wrestling with the most, looking at what people want. I, I won't dwell on this. This is the first 10 um, uh, top priorities, so it's about the quality uh, and quantity of groundwater. And then down at the bottom is landscape and natural features are projected, protected and enhanced. Um, those two are intimately connected, uh, and yet they're not... Um, in people's minds. So um, somehow this protection of groundwater so we could all pop down artesian well to do whatever we want to do with it is, um, it is, is just divorced from that ecosystem view. And um, as I looked down through um, all of the priorities, people, and, and this is now on from 11 down to 20, and then there's a slide that goes on to 35, these are all very great goals. Um, but there is no way in which people yet have a way of bringing them together, uh, of integrating one with the other. And, and um, therefore, we've got to find a way of weaving um, those great desires of people together um, in a very coherent and powerful way um, to address these enormous challenges. So these are enormous challenges for you in your city, but these are enormous challenges for humankind across the world. So for you to be able to do this here um, in a very uniquely New Zealand way, um, and then perhaps, I, well not perhaps, I know that learning that great practice will then be um, a great um, benefit to others elsewhere, just as you will learn uh, as you progress on this journey um, from those places around the world which are sowing those seeds of a good Anthropocene. So, broadly speaking, what might be the... Um, I'm reluctant to say RRZ. It sounds like what sort of separates North and South Korea <laughs> um, or something. Um, anyway, um, the residential red zone. Um, as I say, I'm trying to make the case to you that um, the residential red zone uh, has absolutely um, the com absolute ability to create transformative change, to create a truly 21st century city um, here in Christchurch. By bringing nature back into the city, not just as a place to play hockey or row on rivers, um, um, and triggering environmental, so and I think I've got this more or less in the right order, uh, environmental, social, cultural, political, and economic revival. Because existing systems won't deliver what people want. Um, so that's how fundamental the change has to be. So therefore, all the processes that you have to pioneer to do this um, are part of that great transformative change. And the world is crying out. Uh, for that. The world is groaning for that. 
those new processes, technologies, and models. And then, thereby, achieving strong resilience and deep sustainability, uh, and thus restoring people's relationship with the ecosystem. So, essentially, I've only got one thought, is that the ecosystem will teach us everything and will be our guide in this. Um, and it's the ecosystem which will integrate and help us integrate uh, what we desperately desire um, um, to, and making this happen, which then enlivens this city um, and um, elsewhere in New Zealand, um, and I think play a big role in the world. This only happens in one way, though. Uh, whilst all the issues I've touched on are truly global um, and deeply interdependent, one issue on another, um, the solutions are only local, because it is only locally that we can achieve this utterly unprecedented speed of change, scale of change, and complexity of change that humankind has never come within Kui of before. It only happens in community that then gets scaled up and passed on from one community to another. So this requires very strong learning communities, ones which have a common sense, a common understanding of what needs to be done, um, a common purpose about how they're going to do it, and then they generate absolutely boundless common wealth to be shared um, across all of those many wealths, not just the economic one. So this is where um, places where people, individuals, are valued and helped and encouraged so they can contribute um, their unique skills to that, and then they also change. Let me just, one last thought. Um, it's a fragment of a poem I um, often turn to. This is Alan Kernow writing in 1943, I think, on the 300th anniversary of Abel Tasman's ill-fated sail past of New Zealand in which a few people died. Um, and um, the gist of this poem is that now we know the whole world um, and we know what's there, where do we find something that's new and better and different? So here it is. But now there are no more islands to be found and the eye scans risky horizons of its own in unsettled weather. And murmurs of the drowned haunt their familiar beaches. Who? navigates us towards what unknown, but not improbable provinces, who reaches a future down for us from the high shelf of spiritual daring? Thank you very much, Rod, for um, ending that on such a poetic note. <laughs> so, um, if you're anything like me, your head is probably spinning at the moment with a barrage of all sorts of really interesting and challenging thinking um, of provocations, inspirations, um, some quite dire warnings about uh, what we might be heading to. But also, I think, as Marianne put it, um, some gifts from our panelists tonight in terms of some real um, gems of thinking that we can begin to overlay onto some of the other thinking that um, we've had in terms of what to do about the residential red zone and how it can perhaps be something that we can show the world, something that we can be an exemplary city. And even that question of what is a 21st century city um, you know, having been out in the red zone today and, and looking around it, it hardly feels like a city at all, of course, because, it, I mean, it feels very much like the countryside. So we have all sorts of challenges about what this thing is that we're, we're dealing with. So we have a little time now for some questions and really to focus on um, how we can get some more from our panellists while they're here tonight and um, try and, and draw out some more ideas in terms of the sorts of things that they've brought up tonight, in terms of ecology, environment, economics, um, nature, culture, all the things that have come through tonight and that big challenge of how we might possibly integrate all of these things. It is a huge and complex and exciting challenge that we have. So it'd be really interesting to hear questions from all of you here and I understand from people around the world watching us live on Facebook. <laughs> so questions please. Kia ora. thank you 
wonderful presentations. <coughs> but thinking to that future, that unknown, never trying to navigate to that future, to that wonderful ecosystem that Rod talks about, and to the Mahinga Kai that Joseph talks about, we have to take something from that high shelf. And I think the government was very, was, was amazing that they created the residential red zone and it was taking something off the high shelf because three weeks before the February earthquake, that whole area that is delineated as the residential red zone had been zoned as flood prone with a half metre sea level rise. And as we know from last week's government, the misrelease of the government data says we now need to allow for two metres of sea level rise for future development. So that I'd ask the panel, you know, this is all need, it can't be built on, from what I understand. It can't be built on. So I'm I'm just a little confused. I'd like a response because talking about housing and, you know, I'd love shared housing all around, but it's not about that, is it? Can I just get a response that we're talking about a space that is going to be inundated? Thank you. Um, if I, I'll, I'll jump straight in, if I may. Um, I think it's very important to um, uh, address that in, in uh, several different ways. But the first one is um, building obviously comes in all kinds of forms from um, something that you hope might last for hundreds of years um, through something that's very temporary and movable. Um, so a judicious use of some of that space uh, for some buildings, um, recognizing that some of them might have a, a fairly short life um, depending how rapid sea level rise is, um, or, um, and certainly keeping out of areas that are going to be very um, flood prone with um, very modest levels in sea rise. Um, but also knowing that as the um, back from the estuary back up the river um, becomes a more natural ecosystem again, there will be greater resilience in that to deal with rising sea levels. And so that's what you're seeing in all sorts of coastal places around the world. So yes, we have to be very mindful we can't turn back um, sea level rise, um, and it'll be a number of meters. We also probably can't do a Dutch approach to dike the whole thing, because that would be phenomenally expensive. Um, but we can make the, that land um, and, and that ecosystem a lot more resilient and adaptable than it is now. Um, but it would require very careful um, building of a, of a variety of different structures and forms of building. If I may also die, the Dutch um, methodology of building floating homes with zero emissions. So th solar panels on top of the roofs to, so that there's no need for an ele electrical connection composting toilets so there's no need for a sewage connection. The only thing that is required is perhaps an alkaline, alkaline pipe that supplies um, water for showering and, and washing and cooking. I think what we need to do is perhaps take off the blinkers of the Western 1950s bungalow style of housing and start looking at what other options there are available. I mean, we, we live in a country where we, are, we, we manage things on the smell of an oily rag um, with a number eight wire fencing approach. And you know we have a team that's going up against um, perhaps one of the richest men in America and pulling his pants down in a sailing race. We, we have the ability to think outside the square and, and to utilize and to think of different methods and manners in which to solve problems. And I think the way we look at how we house our people in the future is, is one option. Well, good thing I'm Dutch. <laughs> So um, the Dutch have lived with, uh, with water for 400 years, and as you said, they've mm. watched that very carefully. And in the process, made some mistakes and went too fast. And at the moment, you see them giving back to the river and to mm. the coasts uh, quite, quite nicely and, and becoming more creative about how to work with nature, uh, in including seeing buildings as ecosystems 
So, and, and mm -hmm. what can you, I mean, it's a water catchment in a way. It's a, it's a place you produce food, and you produce, produce energy, you produce all kinds of things. So, and that's most certainly, I've always been puzzled about the way you build here, but I'm, yeah, <laughs> um, who am I to say? Yeah, I think the, the words that came up there in, in terms of creativity and, and yeah. perhaps innovation as well is a real, really important part of what we're looking at here in terms of the kinds of questions that might be asked and opening it out rather than closing it down. So, in Philippines, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, th I absolutely agree about the keeping the umbil umbilical cord and um, thinking about trying to improve the water and the, and, and the whole of the river. So I think that, and that's a solution that, say, Toronto used with its Finger Lakes, which were flooded, which Whanganui is doing in the path. And actually, when we were drive, driven round. Um, the red zone around by the river. It's main, the main people you see are people walking dogs and and um, cycling and so forth. But I still think, you know, maybe between the four avenues moving out, there has to be some more rapid buildings and more creative buildings um, done there because it's like, you know, that you have to have that beating heart in the city for people to get out and come into it and meet other people. And that's that's the big lack that I s see at the moment. And obviously there's some, you know, there's a wonderful piece of sculpture outside and there's the Mahi Mahi, Margaret Mahi children's playground and so forth. But they're all really huge um, things. I think what we need is some organic building of houses, coffee bars, you know, workshops in, in, in the inner city. And that's what I would see taking a more organic model of that. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yep, one down here. and just talking about my land, we need to be paid for our land like they promised. That hasn't happened. No one's ever taken into consideration our well-being either. And our children and the marriage split-ups and everything else that's happened through this. Nothing like that's ever been spoken about. And what about memory? What about memory and the communities that were there? Has anyone thought about that? Well, I think that all of those things are really important, and I think there will be an opportunity to talk about that a little bit later in terms of... But, but, why, but why isn't it most important now? I don't mean, late, I mean later this evening. I think that the, the guests that we have here tonight are perhaps not the, the best ones to answer the questions that you have, and um, certainly in terms of memory and so on, that, that is something that uh, really needs to be considered in terms of the land. Um, but about I think our land payments before you do anything to our land? It's not yours to take until we've paid. Maybe I'm an outsider, and so, I mean, I followed it very, I followed it closely, but I, I mean, I, I don't have power in the situation. But, but I do, I, I absolutely um, hear what you're saying in terms of the pain and the, mm -hmm. and the loss in it, which I think is, um, you know, here rather than up there. Yeah, <laughs> you, when you've you, been you, paid for the You've land. experienced. So, I mean, that's the, the reconstruction you know, it's like after a heart attack where you've got to kind of get the heart working again. And um, so, it, I mean, I think that's, you know, and the, the, the intensity with which you say it, that's all, you know, and I know there are many people like you. It's like, that's the, the, that's the biggest challenge that well, the city's faced. Why are we not face. considered before you even consider doing anything with this land? Well, that's, that's, that's an important voice to come out in that discussion, and that, again, thank between central and local government, it's, a, it's a, you know, complicated. Yeah, and I think the, you know, that real challenge of the complexity of all of this um, is definitely very much part of it, and, and hopefully the, the whole um, vision will do justice to that. Thanks. Other questions over there? Chris? Thank you, yep. panellists, uh, for a very interesting uh, uh, talks this evening. The thing that I want to challenge you with is um, in trying to build this 21st century city, how much are we valuing heritage? Because in the red zone, you can, we look, one avenue is to let things go back to a, a past heritage. We've got the built environment 
and we've lost a lot of our heritage in Christchurch, and how much do we value uh, retaining any of that? And I, being a transport person, I fully understand transport and land use and the need to, we need to do things somewhat differently from what we've been doing, but we're building back on the same grid lines or the same um, cadastral. Um, in the red zone, you've got a, basically a completely new ownership pattern and there's another chance. Any comments? Any comments on heritage? It's interesting, um, uh, Rod mentioned the Nielsen report, and uh, it was interesting to note on that that heritage actually ranked quite low, I think, in terms of the, the sorts of people that, uh, things that people valued the most. Water was right up the top. So, and of course, heritage is something I'm fascinated about as well, so it'd be really interesting to hear from the panellists in terms of that uh, heritage is one of those, those layers within thinking about the 21st century city. Yeah. Um, um, I realize this is a, um, a, um, a, a hard thing to say, uh, and it's hard for, uh, to hear, um, particularly for um, people who uh, have lived for some two or three generations, say, since the, um, uh, over the last 70 years, of, of much of that land was developed into housing, because that is your community. That's uh, where you people grew up and that's their whole lives were there. Um, but we, it's not going to be possible to go back to that form of um, urban development. Um, quite honestly, it shouldn't have been there. I know it's a hard thing to say for people who actually made it to home because um, it was such a vulnerable environment um, and it would be deeply vulnerable even if there hadn't have been the earthquakes. So it's not possible to go back to that. Um, um, it's, I think, rather more a question of trying to um, take some of those great, um, some of those great, the great story, the great history, um, those relationships, um, and give, um, a, a, a find a, a way to build a, an urban environment, um, hopefully in part of that red zone, um, which um, is right for that environment, that ecosystem, that can withstand better um, those great shocks of nature. Um, but um, so I think heritage would have to be evoked that way, just as we can't, just as even if we let um, that land and that water restore itself naturally, it wouldn't go back to an ecosystem dated, say, pre the pre Abel Tasman or the first Europeans here. Mm. It wouldn't go back to that. Mm. Um, the natural system is constantly evolving. It it'll, would evolve into something else. So I think um, to hold a lot of that history and a lot of those values dearly and closely over time, just as Joseph um, is able to talk uh, for his people about what was where, um, but recognizing that what we do from here um, will be moving forward, be evolving into something else. And if I can add a brief thing to that, remember we're creating heritage now. Buildings that are built now are going to last 90 years. And do we want glass walls for the next 90 years? So I, I think we can think about past heritage, but we're creating heritage now. Mm. I think that's a really good point to finish on, heritage for the future and heritage from the past. Unfortunately, we, we've run out of time for this evening. Um, so I would like to thank our panellists for sharing their knowledge and expertise and vision and um, emotion about what they've uh, seen today. So thanks to Joseph, Marianne, Philippa and Rod for coming along and um, contributing to the panel this evening about what is the possible contribution that this land can make. And thanks also to all of you for coming along tonight and those of you who are watching it uh, live online. Um, it's really important that this is the beginning of a, um, a set of presentations in terms of thinking about uh, possibilities for the residential red zone. So uh, this time, same place, same time next week um, will be Ryan Gravel, who's the conceiver of the Atlanta Beltline, which is a, another really inspiring exemplar project to be thinking about in terms of uh, what might be happening for Christchurch. 
Um, Ryan Gravel is also going to be leading um, part of the Design Jam, which is on, uh, not this weekend, but the next weekend. So if you are um, under 25, it's a youth event, a young person's event, to be part of a, a Design Charette. If you can sign up for that online and contribute to that project as well. So um, thanks again for coming along and keep engaged and we'll look forward to the future. So thanks again to the panellists.